On today's episode of What's Going On With Shipping, Congress has identified a screaming national security vulnerability. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to today's episode. So, Representative Mike Gallagher, Republican from Wisconsin, has sent a letter from his committee, the Select Committee on the Chinese Communist Party, to the commander of the United States Transportation Command, General Von Ovest, and to the head of the Maritime Administration, Ann Phillips, to identify a woefully, woefully inadequate sea lift fleet. This is the fleet of commercial vessels and military vessels that we use to transport military equipment for the Department of Defense. They identified it being woefully inadequate to sea lift over the Department of Defense goods in case of a conflict against China in the indio pacom area. This is the Indian Ocean Pacific area of operations. We're going to take a look at that letter. We're going to talk about what Representative Gallagher identified and then look at the questions he posed to General Van Ovest and Administrator Phillips and see if I can come up with some answers to this because this subject is right up my alley. Not only did I sail on board sealift ships, not only did I work for the Military Sealift Command, but my doctoral dissertation was on military sealift from the Spanish-American War all the way up to the Iraq War. So this is right up my alley, right in my wheelhouse. We're going to go ahead and take a look at it and I'm going to give you my answers to the questions that representative gallagher has posed if you're new to the channel hey take a moment subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out so here's the letter over to representative gallagher i'll have it attached to a story from mike schiller over at g captain so you can read this whole letter here but he identifies three key issues number one the size and age of the sea lift fleet. The sea lift fleet today, those ships that are owned by the government that can be earmarked to be loaded in the United States and shipped overseas is 60 vessels. 45 of them are held by the Department of Transportation's Ready Reserve Force. This was a fleet of vessels created post Vietnam War in 1977. And those ships of the Military Sea Lift Command, this is the civilian arm of the U.S. Navy. Now, the ships of the Military Sea Lift Command, some of them are already loaded and out in service in what's called a float prepositioning for the Army, the Marine Corps, and the Air Force. So they have about 15 vessels that are in that service. And then the Ready Reserve Force, those ships managed by the Maritime Administration, there's about 45 of those. And they are laid up in ports along the Gulf east and west coast, about evenly divided, about a third on each coast, in what's called a reduced operating status. It takes five days to acti activate those vessels. They have a small cadre crew on board, about 10 personnel, but they would require about three times that many to get up and running. Now, what Representative Gallagher identified was three key shortfalls. Number one, the size. The fact that we only have 60 ships in the sea lift fleet represents a vulnerability. During the Second World War, we lost 10% of our commercial vessels. 60 vessels, you are earmarked to lose potentially six vessels if you have a level of combat akin to what we saw in World War II. He also identifies as the age of the sea lift ship. The average age of the sea lift fleet is about 45 years old. There's a ship in the sea lift fleet, the general, uh, the gas turbine ship Admiral William M. Callahan, named for the very first commander of military sea lift command. That ship is 56 years old. 56. I'm 56. If you're sending me to war, we're screwed. If we're counting on a 56-year-old ship to get us to war, we may not be in great shape here, people. So I think Gallagher is making a pretty uh, good point here, the fact that we may not have enough ships and they may not be old, uh, maybe not young enough. Second thing he identifies is mariners. There's been a repeated plea by the commanders of Transcom, the Transportation Command, and MARAD, the Maritime Administration, that we have insufficient mariners. Uh, previous commanders, uh, Admiral Busby at Marad and General Lyons at Transcom, testified before Congress that we're 1,800 mariners short should there be a protracted six-month warfare where we have to activate the sea lift fleet. I think those numbers are way low. I think we are much, we're in worse shape. We need a lot more mariners than 1,800 because we're going to have a lot of mariners walk off. We're going to lose mariners. There's no way we have no, enough mariners. Mariners. And so I, I think we're having a crucial Mariner shortfall. And then third is the lack of readiness. In 2019, General Lyons and Admiral Busby conducted what was called Turbo Activation Plus 
19. This was an activation of most of the Ready Reserve Force in September of 2019. The Ready Reserve Force is supposed to be at an 85% availability. We have ships that have about 10 million square feet of cargo space, and about 85% of that should be available at any one time. So about 8.5 million square feet. Uh, Based on the test they did in 2019, only 40% of the ships met their mission capability. Now, we've raised that since then. However, if you're planning, if you're in the Indio PACOM, if you're planning on a conflict with, with China or there's an issue in CENTCOM, Central Command, or European Command, you may not have the seal of ships you think you need to conduct your mission. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the questions that Representative Gallagher posed to General Von Ovest and to Administrator Phillips. All right, I'm a little bit excited here for the questions. I can't wait. I'm, I'm looking forward. This is going to be like Jeopardy for Sal right here. All right, question number one. Do you believe the current size of the seal of fleet is sufficient to meet sustainment requirements for a major operation in the indo Pacific? No. The answer is no. If, if there's any other word than no, that answer is wrong. There is not enough ships to meet this sustainment requirements. No. We, we are woefully short. I'm telling you, no. It's the answer. I don't have to think any more of this. It's no. We don't have enough ships. Uh, not only do we have enough ships, but the ships that we do have, we, there's big questions about them. Age, reliability. I, I mean, I could go on and on. But if there's any other answer than no to this question, then I, it's, it's, it's not right. All right, following up that question, if not, okay, <laughs> obviously Gallagher knew what the answer was going to be. Please explain your plans for creating a seal of fleet capable of providing full logistical support during a crisis, including the time and resources that would be required to put together such a fleet. So understand, the way we used to do this was very f simple. We counted on a commercial U.S. fleet. We would rely on the commercial U.S. fleet. We would use them in the interim, and then we would pull ships out of the reserve fleet or government-owned ships to kind of replace those commercial ships as they got back on service. Did it in World War I, did it in World War II, did it in Korea, did it in Vietnam, kind of did it in the first Persian Gulf War. But what we've done is bifurcated the commercial merchant marine from the military. And now what we find ourselves in is a situation where we're not building commercial ships anymore in the U.S. We have basically outsourced that to initially Europe and Japan and Korea, but now over to China. And now we're not building commercial ships. And that has cost us not just the lack of building ships in the United States for the commercial industry, but also for the Navy, because shipyards now are just sole source to the Navy. So what we have to do is create a program to rebuild not the sea lift fleet, but the U.S. Merchant Marine. And now I'm not talking about creating a program where we build so many ships that we haul all our cargo ourselves, but we need to do this. Understand, China heavily subsidizes their Merchant Marine. That forces Japan and Korea to do the same. They build 94% of the world's ships. We need to get into that program. We should set forth a program where we're earmarking to build 30 ships, 10 tankers, 10 roll-on, roll-off ships, and 10 container ships. Put them into service, operating along the coast of the United States in some international trade. Lease these vessels out to commercial operators and get them out there. That's what we need to do. And those ships can be earmarked for military service if needed. This is not that hard to do. We've done this time and time again in the past. The problem is you've got to have the commitment to this. The money's got to be committed to it. We've got to build these ships. We've got to get operators for these. And most importantly, we've got to get cargo for them. All right, let's go to question number two. The average age of the ships in the Ready Reserve Force is 45 years old. Yes, we know. Please explain the ways in which the age of the vessels limit your capabilities and readiness to support operations in the Indo-Pacific. Okay, well, if I'm relying on anything that's 45 years old, I'm going to tell you what it's going to happen. It's going to break. I can't imagine putting something old in charge of something. If you're, if you're relying on something that's old, it's going to be a problem. And let me be clear. I worked for Military Seal of Command in the 1990s. Some of the ships that are in the Reserve Force I was using back in the 1990s, and we broke them on a constant basis. And back in the 1990s, we had hard times finding parts for them. In the 1990s, 30 years later, it's going to be worse. It's hard to get parts. Understand, one of the things that makes up the Ready Reserve Force are these clumps of ships, the Cape Ds, the Cape Hs, the Cape Is. What's going to happen when we activate all those ships is they're not all going to activate. There's like five Cape Ds. We may get four of them to work. 
The fifth one, we're going to steal for parts. And, and this is going to be the thing. We're going to see parts have to be stolen from a lot of these ships to get them up and running. Now, the MARAD, the Maritime Administration, has done a lot to try to source parts and everything. But it's going to be a problem. So once you start running these ships, and remember, most of these ships haven't been run for a long period of time. We use them periodically for exercises, for lift operations, but not all of them. So once you start using them for a while, it's going to be a problem. You know, take your car, stick it in your garage, and don't start it for three years. There, there's going to be issues. There's going to be issues. And so these are some of the big limitations we have. Plus, some of these ships use steam plants. Steam as a propulsion was basically outlawed by the IMO in 2020. There are no really steam-operated vessels. The reason that there's still steam vessels in the, the uh, uh, Ready Reserve Force is because they're government-owned ships. They're, they're excluded from that. So we're going to have a lot of issues here. So number three, what are your plans to acquire U.S. or foreign merchant ships to augment our sea lift fleet? Okay, so, so there's a program in underway called Sea Lift Recapitalization. This is a very grandiose phrase to sit there and, so and say, hey, we're going to buy some used ships. We're going to go out in the market and go buy used cargo ships. Now, this was the plan all along. Can it be clear? We've had this plan for years. Uh, after the first Persian Gulf, we went out and we bought a dozen ships and stuck them in the fleet. And then they finally came up with the idea is, well, we'll buy some used ships and put them in the fleet. This has been a disaster of epic proportions. <laughs> Can I be clear about this? Number one, they went out, the government, and surveyed the world for ships that they wanted to buy. Well, when you do that, when you start looking around the world for ships the U.S. government wants to buy, and then you send inspectors out to those ships, and you inspect those vessels, you're kind of telling the companies that you're interested in their ships. And what do they do when you come buying them later on? They raise the price. They make them really expensive. And then we're out buying ships, roll-on, roll-off ships, these big, huge car deck ships where you can load all this cargo on board. We're buying them at the time in the marketplace we're in the most demand. We didn't wait and buy them when they were cheap and everyone could buy them. We bought them when they're at the most demand. We just bought two ships, the, the, the Cape uh, uh, Cortez and the Cape Arundel. We got them from a U.S. flagged operator, American roll-on, roll-off carriers. They sold those ships to the U.S. government for $25 million apiece. They're 25-year-old ships. They're 25-year-old ships. They sold them for more than twice the scrap value of the vessel. And these are ships that were basically nothing but scrap. They were U.S. flag vessels. And understand, the U.S. government has had those two ships now for over a year, and they can't get them flagged into the U.S. registry. The Coast Guard will not register them. They've been sitting down in New Orleans and Norfolk trying to get registered, and they're not registered into the U.S. registry. They came from the U.S. registry, but yet the Coast Guard won't register them into the U.S. registry. I don't know. It, it's, it's a strange story. Then they went out and bought three ships from an Italian company, Messina Lines, what are now the Cape S's. And these vessels are w great ships. I mean, they're 10 years old. They're beautiful ships. I mean, just gorgeous. I mean, they're a great... Oh, oh Madonna mia. They're, they're, they're beautiful ships. They're beautiful Italian ships. They're great. But holy crud, they're expensive. We paid more for a 10-year-old ship than the Italian line paid to build the ships. Yes, we paid more money for the ships 10 years later than to build them. And not only do we pay more for them, about 90 to $110 million, but then we got to convert them over to the U.S. registry. And we basically blew all our money to buy those ships. So buying U ships is a problem. Oh, and I should also mention one other thing. Those first two ships we bought, the Cape uh, Arundel and the Cape Cortez, they're operated by American roll-on, roll-off carriers, which is a subsidiary of Willenius Lines. Willenius Lines is going to get replacement vessels. For those two vessels, they're getting them built in China. So yeah, so money we spent to buy those ships is going to China to build new replacement ships for them. This is a terrible plan. Can I be clear? This is just awful. This is awful. You know what we should be doing? We should be building ships here. That's what we should be doing. I'm just saying. It's just, I, I don't know. It's just, it's, what do I know? All right, next. Okay. Obviously, we knew this was going to be a bad question because there's two questions that follow this up. Please describe how much such purchases could increase our sea lift capacity. Well, <laughs> let's be clear. We've bought two ships, and then we bought three more. But in that same period of time, we have lost more ships. 
because they got so old we had to scrap them. So even what we're buying now is not keeping up with what we're losing. So we're actually a negative in terms. We're not buying them fast enough. We don't have enough money allocated for them. They're too expensive to buy and convert. And what we're buying is probably not the best benefit for the long run. It goes on, please describe the limitations to relying on new purchases. Well, <laughs> this is it. You're basically just kicking the can down the road. When you buy 25-year-old roll-on, roll-off ships, and even when you buy 10-year-old roll-on, roll-off ships, understand a 10-year-old ship today is a lot different than a 10-year-old ship 20 years ago. The ship's 20 years, you know, 20 years ago were designed to last 30, 40 years. Ships today are not designed for that. They're designed to last 15, maybe 20 years. So you're not buying something that's going to last for a long term. Goes on, whether of U.S. or foreign vessels, them to strengthen our sealift fleet. Please also describe whether your plans involve acquiring merchant ships from China. Well, since China is building over 40% of the world's ships, it's hard not to buy ships from China because there are just so many out there. And understand, we have ships in the U.S. registry right now from China. So if you don't want to buy from China, you're really limiting the number of ships you can buy. It becomes very difficult. Now, Japan and Korea are the other biggest shipbuilders. They, between the two of them, build about 50% of the world's ships. But Japan is in amazing decline right now, and Korea is struggling to keep up what it has at the expense of Japan, largely. Because there's a three-way shipbuilding war going out in East Asia. And if we think we could just rely on Japan and Korea, we misunderstand the situation. All right, let's go ahead to the next question. Man, these are great. Question number four. What are your plans to increase the number of mariners who will be available to crew our seal of vessels during a crisis? All right, let me be clear about something. We have tons of mariners. You have the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy at Kings Point. You have six state maritime academies. Massachusetts, Maine, Michigan up on the Great Lakes, Texas, California, and of course, the ultimate of them all right there, New York Maritime, obviously the best. We, we're producing third mates and third assistant engineers, kind of the, the, the bottom grade of the, of the deck and engineering officers, like crazy. We're, we're doing that all the crazy. We, we have unlicensed programs where we're producing unlicensed. The problem we have is mid-level and senior officers because what's happening is very much what's happening in the U.S. military is mariners are not going to sea, which means they're not advancing their licenses. We need a program where merchant mariners can go into like a reserve type program and advance their licenses. I'm not talking strategic sea lift officers. There's a, there's a Navy program called strategic sea lift officers. I'm not talking about that. Merchant mariners don't want to go in the Navy. A lot of them don't want to have anything to do with the Navy. What they want to do is keep their licenses. But the biggest problem here is the U.S. Coast Guard because the U.S. Coast Guard oversees marine credentialing. And the U.S. Coast Guard isn't in the Department of Transportation anymore where the Maritime Administration is. They're in the Department of Homeland Security. And they they are so detached right now, and, and there are so many new rules that are required to maintain a merchant marine license. I can't keep my old license up. If I had to go back to sea now, I would spend a fortune to have to update my license to get all the credentialing I need. And then even if I get it, I can't keep it. Because you need so much sea time. Now, if I could go onto a reserve ship and do two weeks a year or something like that, or a weekend kind of like in the reserves, then that would be a way to do it. But we need to do that for merchant marine officers who want to do that, and not just in the Navy, because they can't meet all the criteria of the Navy, but they don't need to. It's the merchant marine. We should be doing that not just for ocean-going ships, but for tugs and barges, inland waterways. There used to be something called the U.S. Maritime Service, which was created in World War II, Article 13 of the Merchant Marine Act of 1936. We need to bring that back so that we can train merchant mariners and keep them, allow them to maintain their licenses, advance, and they'd be available in time of war. But the best way to keep the number of mariners is create friggin' jobs. Put mariners on ships. I can create that right now, tomorrow. Go modify the Passenger Vessel Service Act. Go modify that. Change that so that any cruise ship that sails from a U.S. port has to have at least 50% of its licensed officers with U.S. credentials. Right there. Right there. All those cruise ships sailing out of Miami, out of Fort Lauderdale, out of the West Coast, every place. Half of them have to have U.S. 
officers on board. There's no reason that we can't do that. There's no. If you want to take advantage, come to the United States and, and, and embrace the, the, the uh, use of our ports and get our people on your ships, then hire some American merchant mariners, Captain Kate McHugh and Celebrity. She's a huge star, Cal Maritime grad. Everybody loves her, but understand, no one wants to go work for a cruise line as a, as a right out of school mate because their pay sucks. It's terrible. It is awful. It is just ridiculously awful. Pay a decent wage and make them required to use U.S. mariners. That gets officers on the deck and the engine side licensed. This is easy to fix. There are a lot of easy fixes to this, but no one wants to deal with it. All right. Will such plans fully remedy the current shortage of mariners? No. The only remedy for the current shortage of mariners is more jobs. And that means re-stimulating and rebuilding a vibrant U.S. merchant marine, not just on the international trade, but on the domestic trade. That's the way you fix this. The problem we have today is that we don't have a vibrant domestic trade. We have less than 180 deep draft vessels evenly split between the coastal trade and the international trade. We need more of that. All right. Question number five, our last question. Uh, how much will we need to rely on foreign flag, foreign crewed vessels to meet shortfalls in our sea lift capability? A lot. I'm, I'm not going to say it, it, It's very simple. A lot. We're going to have to do it. I'm doing a study right now on World War I. To ship the American Expeditionary Force to Europe, 49%, 49% went on British ships. 6% went on ships of other registries, French, uh, Russian, Italian, Belgian, uh, you name it. Only 45% went on U.S. flag vessels because we didn't have enough tonnage. Matter of fact, we, had, we were so short of tonnage in the United States, we started a massive shipbuilding pr program, but it started late. So we were just getting ships built in 1918. But we were so short of ships that, for example, we stole 20 intern German and Austrian passenger liners in our ports. Those ships carried 25% of the, of, or excuse me, they carried half of the 45% of the ship of the AEF over to Europe. So, you know, of the 45% we shipped over on US flagships, half of them were on German ships. And then when we were still short, we stole 87 Dutch ships, which were neutral in World War One in our ports. We basically sent U.S. Marshals on board and seized the vessels and told the Dutch, sorry, we need your ships. We, we used what was called the right of Angari. Uh, it's an old medieval right that if a ship is in your port during wartime, you have the right to seize it. I don't know where the heck this thing came from. They pulled this out of some medieval butt, but, but they used it. And we were able to grab the Dutch ships. Now, the Dutch, I think, were incomplacent with this. I think the Dutch kind of signed off on this. We'd have to do the same thing if we had a war. We would see ships in our ports. We would go to operating companies that maybe are in friendly countries, Maersk in Denmark, Mediterranean Shipping in Switzerland, CMA, CGM in France. But I think one of the things we're seeing right now with the Houthi that that may not work the way we think it will. I did a study of the Merchant Marine in the Vietnam War, and foreign ships would not go to Vietnam. They did not would they would not go to Vietnam because of their their opposition against the Vietnam War. And so the U.S. had to rely almost entirely ninety five percent of the goods that went to Vietnam were on U.S. flag ships because we could not rely on foreign ships for that. They kind of balked at it. So we would have a, a big problem with that. Crews, another issue. We would have to pay very extensively for these crews. Now, one of the largest crewing assets out there is the Philippines. Uh, the Filipinos create a huge, massive fleet. Remember, Philippines was part of the United States until 1946. But there's no reason we're in the process of negotiating with the Philippines once again. Maybe we can get Filipino mariners back out there. There's a lot of little things you can do, but you need to start having those agreements. And understand, those agreements aren't with the, with the countries for ships. You got to be talking to the companies. You got to be talking to Mediterranean shipping. You got to be talking to Maersk, Kophog, Evergreen. Are we talking to Evergreen? If there's a war with Taiwan, if, if, if China invades Taiwan, what's Evergreen going to do? The largest Taiwanese container company. Are they going to come? Because a lot of their ships aren't owned by Evergreen. They're owned by these holding corporations. Is a holding corporation going to risk their ship? Maybe not. They may just lay it up and sit there and say, you can't use the ship. Then what do we do? Do we have to seize them? Well, even if we seize them, where do we get the crews? How do we operate them? Where do we get the parts for them? There are a lot of questions that are involved in all of this. 
And then lastly, what do you assess are the risks of doing so? Well, the risks are you seize these vessels and you don't have enough of them or you don't know how to operate them, which is a big problem. From which countries will such foreign flag, foreign crew vessels come from? Again, you need to start having it. The, the mariners out there, the five countries that provide the most merchant mariners of the 1.8 million mariners out there are the Philippines, China, India, Indonesia, and wait for it, Russia. So China, probably not going to use those. Russia, probably not. Indonesia and India, depends on how they're feeling. And then the Philippines. And so that's a big issue out there. There's a lot of questions to assess with these. These are really good questions from uh, Representative Gallagher. I'm going to be interested to see how General Van Ovest and Administrator Phillips answer these. Supposedly, they need to be answered by the end of February. I'll be interested to see what those answers are. Maybe we'll compare and contrast them later on. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? Well, well, first, rebuild the U.S. Merchant Marine. Let's let's gather some money to help rebuild the Merchant Marine, and so we have a sea lift fund. But if you're not willing to make that contribution right now, then help support the page. You know, help help a help a buddy out and support the page. How do you do that? Well, you hit that super thanks button down below, where you can contribute directly to the page, or head on over to Patreon and you become a monthly or yearly subscriber. I mean, because once again, if if I am the picture perfect image of our nation's military sea lift, aged, decrepit, running out of steam, then we need help, people. Because, again, if, if we're counting on a ship my age to go save us, <sighs> screwed. <laughs> we're, just, we're just screwed. Oh, hey, China, don't watch this. Don't watch this video. I know, we're fine. Everything's fine. No, no, no. I'm just kidding. Everything's fine, China. We, we're, we're robust. We're young. We're ready to rock and roll. That's just, just disregard what you're watching here. <sighs> Till our next video, this is Sal, signing off.